Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Brabeck, and I'm Dean of the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to celebrate a great man and a great work, the process of education, and to start this exactly on time so that we finish exactly on time. Um, I know it's hard to start this conversation because of the many conversations occurring throughout the room. This really is an old home week for so many people here. And you can just feel the warmth of uh, appreciation and admiration that we share um, for this work and for this man who has touched so many of us personally and intellectually. Cognitive development, uh, complex thinking, I mean, we, we in education bow down in great reverence when we hear those words. Um, but it wasn't always that way 50 years ago um, before the process of education was, was published. I was, I'm, I'm from the University of Minnesota where I did my work and that's where B.F. Skinner was, so I know it wasn't always so. Um, but more than anyone else, Jerry Bruner is responsible for bringing us what many have called a cognitive revolution and has influenced so much theory and empirical research in psychology, but other disciplines also, and certainly in education. So much so, so much so, that in 1970, when George Albee, uh, president of the American Psychological Association, gave his presidential speech five years after Jerome Bruner had been president of the American Psychological Association, he said, cognition is in the air. It's here, there, everywhere. Jerry showed us that children of all different ages could learn to think complexly, to categorize knowledge, to conceptualize in increasingly complex ways, and that they could do it in any discipline. In fact, he showed us that cognition knowing itself was disciplinary. Um, and he was a key figure in bringing the disciplines into the study of education. Certainly his own discipline, psychology, but also sociology and history, the arts, and recently at NYU, law is coming into education through Dr. Bruner. Um, and that's why we so appreciate the fact that this uh, is being sponsored by the Department of Humanities and um, social sciences in the professions. And we have John Zimmerman to thank for this wonderful uh, presentation, this great bouquet of people who, whose work is so <laughs> exemplary. Um, and uh, so thank you, John, who is a historian by training and understands the, ne the necessity of deep disciplinary knowledge and an interdisciplinarian, I think, in his heart. Um, Besides producing research, of course, Dr. Bruner's um, work demonstrates a core value for the Steinhardt School, which is that theory informs practice, that the knowing and doing are intricately related, that Jerry's work has shown us the truly iterative relationship between theory and practice, and he has brought his work to parents, to teachers, to school board members, to the Reggio Emilia School, to politicians, to uh, the lay public, recently to lawyers in our law school, and I say with appreciation, he's brought his work to a dean of a school that houses education programs. Um, so he reminds us that it is our duty to share our work, to find audiences beyond our own narrow disciplines, and to bring it out to find its place in the real world, a real world where um, knowing is, is accomplished in real settings, in settings that themselves have cultures. He wrote in The Culture of Education in 1996, how one conceives of education we have finally come to recognize is a function of how one conceives of culture and its aims, professed and otherwise. And as you can see from the program, we are looking both back um, to the 1960s when uh, Jerry published his great book, and we're looking forward to education today and how his work has influenced so much of the work of people in this room and, and beyond. And then after our great panelists speak, we will open the um, room for discussion. There are microphones around the room. And finally, we will ask Dr. Bruner to come and have a final word as our honored guest here. Um, as many of you know, we have a special surprise for you, Jerry. I don't think you knew about this, but as many of you know, 
1958, Jerry was responsible for helping to found the Education Development Center, a truly groundbreaking organization that, like the process of education, helped bring new attention to the issues of national and international importance of education. And EDC continues to do its great work to this day, thanks to the foundation that Jerry made possible. So I would like to invite Vivian Guilfoy, Senior Vice President for Learning and Training Division at EDC to come up and um, say something and give something. Well, thank you for having me be here. It's a real pleasure to be a part of this wonderful celebration, Dr. Bruner. It was back in 1958 that your leadership and inspiration as a co-founder of EDC demonstrated how the fresh and powerful ideas in the process of education could be brought to life in the classroom and the community. You know, in your book, you talked of curriculum as a means of cultivating intellect, but you also said that students need to talk physics, not talk about physics and so much more, especially things like the role of hunches and fertile hypotheses. But you didn't stop there. In the programs and curricula you designed and implemented, you had the courage to bring these ideas together and pursue very challenging approaches to learning. The work was quite revolutionary at the time, having young people use the tools of discovery and evidence to address enduring questions such as, what makes us human? Of course, everyone thinks of Manicourse of Study, MACOS, helping children learn to think like social scientists. And this was at a time in history that was not so hospitable to unleashing the natural curiosity of young people to explore diversity. What is remarkable is that many of the original programs you had a hand in developing are still in use today. You've touched many lives over the years. And Janet Whitla, your very good friend and colleague, who happens to be in Paris today and regrets not being here, put it this way in a note she asked me to share with you. And I quote, when I first crossed EDC's threshold so many years ago to become a research assistant for MACOS, I couldn't have guessed that working with and learning from you would have such a profound influence on my thinking and pursuits from that time forward. In my 25 years as EDC's president, Janet says, I asserted that all our work was grounded in your premise that learning is the most fundamental human characteristic and that education must tap into our will to learn by enlisting our curiosity and desire for competence and reciprocity. From these underpinnings, the powerful edifice of EDC's projects took shape, unquote. So you should know, Dr. Bruner, that our work has now expanded to improving education and health in all 50 states and in 35 countries around the world. And inquiry is at the heart of all we do. Our staff of 1600 continues to build on your vision, your entrepreneurial spirit and collaborative approach that you were so instrumental in creating. And so for your generative and lively contributions to our work and for, your, for the countless students and teachers who have benefited by your thinking and your doing, we thank you, Dr. Bruner, and present a very small token, which is not as small as I'd like, and it's a little heavy, but it's a token of our appreciation from EDC and our president, Dr. Luther Lutke. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vivian. And now it's um, my pleasure to briefly introduce our two moderators of the panels. And brief is impossible with each of them, um, but that's what I will be. Uh, Dr. Howard Gardner is the uh, Hobbes Professor of Cognition and Education at Harvard Graduate School of Education. But we welcome him back here to NYU, where he was the Jacob Javits Visiting Professor a few years ago. So he's back home. A developmental and neuropsychologist, he's best known, of course, for the multiple intelligences, but has done so much more and is currently working on the eternal questions regarding the good, the beautiful, and the true. 
Among his many honors, he received a MacArthur Genius Prize fellowship, uh, fellowship in 1981. He was the first American to receive the prestigious Graumeyer Award in Education. And he, um, um, and I'm welcoming him back to NYU today. Thank you. I'm going to just say one couple things about our second moderator, so we don't jump up and down. Um, Marcelo Suarez Orozco as our own um, professor, the Courtney Sales Ross Professor of Globalization and Education at NYU, uh, where he is the co-director of, um, of iGEMS, the Center for the Immigration and Globalization in Metropolitan Settings. He is, his work is at the crossroads of human learning, culture, development, and well-being. It is interdisciplinary, comparative, and longitudinal. He's winner of many awards and honors, and um, in 2004 was elected to the National Academy of Education. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. Howard Gardner. Thanks, Mary, and uh, thanks, everyone. And hi, Jerry. <laughs> in 1990, I found myself at a conference in Paris sponsored by the OECD. There were educators there from all over the world, very few of whom I knew. One evening, several of us went out for dinner, and over good food and wine, we introduced ourselves to one another. In the course of a half an hour, an amazing fact emerged. A majority of us had been stimulated to work in education through the reading of one book, Jerry Booner's Epoch Making, The Process of Education. At a time when last fall's books are already forgotten, it's truly remarkable that we've gathered to celebrate Jerry Bruner and his indispensable publication of 50 years ago. As you know, the session is divided today into two parts, as Mary mentioned, first looking at the 60s and the background, the second looking at the work in the light of the last 50 years. Um, since I'm a psychologist, and my interests both in psychology and education can be blamed totally on Jerry 45 years ago, I'd like to take literally one minute to point out the background of the book for those of you who weren't there then. In the US, psychologists have long had an interest in educational issues. But until 1960, the interest took three principal forms. One, the IQ test which suggested where students should be placed and what was their intellectual potential. Binet, Spearman, Terman. Those are the IQ people. Number two, the importance of reward and punishment. Here the name of Skinner stands out. And education was no more complex than the right schedule of reinforcements. Number three, the development of specific skills an extreme skepticism about transfer, transfer, Thorndike and his followers. This was the background against which the Woods Hole Conference of 1959 was held, and Jerry's book was published two years later. I was not there. Most of you were not there, though I hope one or two people were there and who are here today. But you can imagine the shock of a book in education by a psychologist, a mainstream psychologist, which did not talk about IQ or reinforcement, and which placed broad disciplinary understandings at the center of education. No wonder those scholars in Paris, whom I met 20 years ago, had been converted, transformed by the reading of a single book. And no wonder that today we are celebrating that singular book and the singular man, Jerry Bruner. It is now a quarter after five, or thereabouts, um, my good wife has been appointed timekeeper. She's going to keep everybody on the panel to five minutes because there's so many wonderful people here who know Jerry. Some of them know, have known him even longer than I. And we want to leave time both at the end of this session and at the end of the second session for people to share their thoughts, their reminiscences. And so, having not only modeled a short introduction, I'm going to also model an extremely short uh, introduction for each of the panelists. We'll do it in alphabetical order so people who come late can figure out who it is. Larry Aber, you're first. Larry is a professor of applied psychology and public policy here at the Steinhardt School. And I think you're going to just speak from there. Okay. 
Okay. You're on. Thank you very much, Howard, and congratulations, and thank you, uh, Dr. Bruner. I want to begin with uh, a quote of, of Dr. Bruner's in Chapter 2 on the importance of structure. The first object of any act of learning, over and beyond the pleasure it may give, is that it should serve us in the future. Learning should not only take us somewhere, it should allow us later to go there more easily. Certainly, we're going to commit acts of learning among consenting adults here this evening, and I plan to have a lot of pleasure in doing that. Um, but how shall we, uh, this evening and Jerry's work serve us into the future, allow us uh, later to go further easier? So one of my themes, even though this is the theme of the 60s, is inverted. I'm going to talk a little bit about back to the future. Um, in the introduction on page nine, Jerry says, schools must also contribute to the social and emotional development of the child if they are to fulfill their function of education for life in a democratic community and for a fruitful family life. If the emphasis in what follows in the book is principally on the intellectual side of education, it is not that the other objectives of education are less important. I say that to immediately invert the conversation. Uh, 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 Jerry deeply believed that, and he wrote the entire book knowing that. It, it is sometimes misunderstood as not deriving from that. So uh, briefly to unpack that quote, schools must contribute to the social and emotional development of children. Must and do. But today the modern question is, is the way they do that positive, explicit, intentional, and evidence-based? Or is it negative, implicit, unintentional, and for lack of a better term, faith-based? Um, uh, um, I, I hope the next generation uh, takes the challenge of the process of education of the whole child in the way that Jerry always originally uh, understood it. If they're to fulfill their potential for the function of education, life, and in democratic society and a fruitful family, if, if that's not guaranteed, Jerry introduced the problematic, if it's to do that, it must take social emotional development uh, seriously. Um, and then finally, in the emphasis on what follows, I would say what follows for the next 50 years or so, uh, if, it, if that's principally on the intellectual, aka the cognitive, side of education, it is not that the other objectives are less important. Really? <laughs> um, I, 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 I think that uh, the evidence now powerfully supports Jerry's empirical claim. I think we have very powerful evidence that that's true. Uh, social emotional development are critical to citizenship and family life as he anticipated, but also to academic attainment and workforce productivity. These are uh, <coughs> truths. But the historical evidence powerfully refutes his normative claim. Uh, SEL, social emotional learning, social emotional development, is not uh, an explicit uh, evidence-based uh, part of education. So, uh, finally, um, finally, uh, later in the chapter, uh, 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 this, the first chapter, Jerry says, the first and most obvious problem then is how to construct curricula that can be taught by ordinary teachers to ordinary students and that at the same time reflect clearly the basic and underlying principles of various fields of inquiry. The question will be raised, how enlist the aid of our most able scholars and scientists in designing curricula for primary and secondary schools? He says the answer already has been given, at least in part, and he goes on. Um, we're still at that 50 years later, and uh, um, there is actually now very exciting work on how to restructure teaching and curricula to simultaneously advance math and reading abilities, and social and emotional learning. Uh, that is capable of being fused. And I, in my final words, I will commend 
the, the Consortium on Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning to you, the website, C-A-S-E-L, uh, a major meta-analysis of 200 studies over 20 years um, with 270,000 children that show that social-emotional learning increases reading and math scores about a quarter of a standard deviation, which is the most consistent educational intervention I've seen in promoting that over 20 years. So uh, for all of this, um, uh, I thank you, uh, Jerry, for stimulating uh, years and years of work. And I am so honored to be part of the celebration for your book and your ideas and you tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks, Larry. Both for modeling what you can say in five minutes and giving us plenty to think about and even to Google thereafter. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Barbara Beatty, who is professor of education at Wellesley College and has been doing a history of progressive education. Um, thank you to everybody. Um, also, Eric, to Eric Narberg, who's done a great job with the logistics. And I always think that's um, I should also say that um, in addition to being a teacher educator, I'm a former kindergarten teacher. Um, I taught in the Boston Public Schools and that shaped me. Um, I have had the pleasure of rummaging around in Jerry's papers in the Harvard University archives. And so what I'm gonna do is to, I found something that I think will shed, I've got a copy of you, Jerry. I found a letter that Jerry wrote on June 17th, 1960 to Jackie and Bob Goodnow now, Jackie is the Australian psychologist who worked with Jerry on his other, one of his other wonderful books, um, his 1956, A Study of Thinking. Now, I want you to listen to this because as a historian, I want you to see what's in the letter and what isn't, and then think about it with the book. Jerry starts by telling Jackie and Bob that he's had a very rich year. And he says he managed to write a little book which Harvard University Press will bring out um, he then goes on to say that in the book he takes some rather drastic positions. <laughs> and he says that, and then he, he say, now listen to, the, but listen to this statement of a here. He goes on with a version of the famous quotation that we all know. This time he says, any subject, any subject can be taught to anybody at any age in some form that is honest. Now I want you to notice what's missing effectively. <laughs> effectively is missing. What's also missing is to any child at any stage of development. But I want to focus on the effectively because that's the challenge I want, to think, I want us to think about and I want Jerry to talk about later. I want him to respond to it. Jerry likes challenges. So, um, and I, all right, so then he goes on to say, and this is just a little funzo, that Lee Cronbach had um, had planned Woods Hole with the specific object of turning me into an educational psychologist. And with that, I forked over two bucks, two dollars to him for membership in the Education Psychology Division of the APA. I bet it costs a lot more today. Um, my point with that, though, is that Jerry has always crossed boundaries. And as Howard mentioned, there is a huge boundary between educational psychology and cognitive psychology, an enormous boundary. And so Jerry's willingness to fork over the two bucks um, is, <laughs> is a Jerryism, is very Jerry. And also, I think, had a really a big impact um, on American education because that had been this, there have been very few of such crossings. Um, we need more, but in Jerry's kind of way. Okay, then Jerry goes on to talk about, um, to say that he just founded uh, recently the Center for Cognitive Studies with George Miller. Really good year. Um, and that one purpose of the center is avoiding discontinuity in the Geneva work that might follow upon Piaget's death. I don't know if you've thought about that, but that's what he says. Um, then he says that he wants the center, he wants to try and make a good working connection between Piaget's work and the tradition of cognitive psychology in America. And I would argue Jerry was one of the main people who reintroduced 
Piaget to America. Um, but Jerry knew Piaget's work in the 1930s when Jerry was at Duke. And Jerry had suspicions then that, very prescient suspicions. Jerry had been working, uh, Jerry had been learning about Cherokee dancing in Western, okay, one minute. <laughs> Jerry picked up that there were problems with Piaget and multiculturalism right back then. All right, now I'm gonna finish up an effective, oh, I think I'm there. Um, okay, three takeaways and back to the question. <coughs> um, for us to think about crossing disciplinary boundaries, particularly the ed psych, developmental psych one, which bedevils us in education. Um, Jerry also, one other point, had brought Skinner. Um, one of the other major accomplishments, Ellen Lagerman mentions this in her book, is that Jerry worked really hard to ameliorate behaviorism and to bring the child back into education. He, Skinner came to Woods Hole and displayed some of his, you say he was actually quite quiet. Um, and then Jerry's work in rejecting the universalism of Piaget and Jerry's own wonderful theories. I used to teach them when I taught ed psych and developmental psych in other life. Okay, finally, effectiveness. What does Jerry mean by effectively? I went through the book, great. I have half a second, time's up. I went through the book and I looked for every meaning of effectiveness and basically he uses it to mean a teacher, I think, who understands the structure of disciplines. This is such a key balancing act, but is also able to encourage intuitive thinking. And to do both of those, it means content, you've gotta know the stuff, but you've also gotta be able to not know the stuff so that kids can actually ask real questions. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Let me read you the last line from the book and I'm done. Jerry talks about this. Okay, the last line of the book is, Jerry talks about the wisdom of the skillful teacher. The last words in the book. And I would argue that we have had many, many very rich years with Jerry, for which we're deeply grateful. A coda in the letter to the Goodnows, he says he's looking forward to sailing his boat around the Chesapeake. That's one of Jerry's great passions. And we have enormously enjoyed Jerry's passions and that he shares them with all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for that uh, demonstration of sleuth work in somebody else's papers. Glad there still are physical papers to look at. So, so. Um, for those of you who didn't read uh, the process of education last night, I think it's, it's, it's important to know that Piaget was not there, but Bearbell Inhelder right. was there, and there's a very long quotation from her. She was the, uh, the partner of Piaget. Um, I believe she was also the only woman at the conference. And uh, Jerry is certainly one of the persons who's done a great deal to help balance that uh, uh, gender asymmetry in the past 50 years. Moving right along, uh, Peter Dow is identified here as first-hand learning, but since I know him, I know he's also a teacher, school head, museum director, and probably most relevant for today, um, the author of the book Schoolhouse Politics, which I think is the best description of the problems that progressive education runs into in a, uh, in a country with a certain kind of legislature and a certain kind of the suspicion of uh, big ideas emanating from Cambridge. Peter? <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Howard. Uh, and I'd just like to say, uh, then just what Howard said, that uh, I'm proud not only to have been a colleague of Jerry's, but also a sailing companion, an avid sailing companion. This little book <clears throat> quite simply changed my life. When it came out in 1960, I had just completed a Master of Arts in teaching. And to be frank, I had a low opinion of pedagogical theory. <clears throat> Whenever possible, I had avoided education courses and did most of my graduate work in my chosen field of history. <clears throat> For me, teaching was not a science. It was a craft that you learned in the classroom. Then I read the process of education and it stopped me in my tracks. I had never thought about teaching as transmitting the structure of the discipline or encouraging intuitive thinking or designing the spiral curriculum or bridging the gap between the frontier of knowledge and the elementary classroom. These ideas challenged me to rethink 
the way I taught. <clears throat> Fast forward to 1965. As department head, I was working on developing the spiral curriculum at the Germantown Friends School in Philadelphia when Jerry came to town to talk about teaching anthropology to fifth graders. <clears throat> I was too low in the Quaker hierarchy to be included in the meeting. <clears throat> but I listened to the tape. Once again, I found his way of thinking arresting. Whoever thought of designing a course around a central question like what makes human beings human? And by understanding that and where it came from to improve the quality of human life. Once again, <clears throat> anyway, so I invited myself to a dinner where he was the featured guest and told him I wished to work with him. Happily, he was looking for practitioners. And I, I think he called them interstitial tissue at the time. <laughs> So I took a leave of absence and moved my family to Cambridge. That leave turned into a 10-year adventure in curriculum reform. Then came the spring of 1975. In April, I was summoned to Washington to meet with the congressional committee that oversees the National Science Foundation's budget. <clears throat> Why, our representatives wanted to know, were we asking 10-year-olds to think about the moral choice that a failed Inuit seal hunter may have to make between caring for his aging mother-in-law and feeding his children. Even Margaret Mead wanted to know my answer to that question. <laughs> now there's little said. <laughs> Jerry said especially. Jerry said especially Margaret Mead. <laughs> Uh, now, there's little said in the process of education about the politics of educational reform, so I was on my own. But as you know, Jerry does question what would happen if the country actually adopted the innovations proposed. He writes in, a, in particular about the possible risk of creating a meritocracy, or as he once colorfully put it, increasing the distance between the head and the tail of the academic procession. <laughs> But he never envisioned Tiger Teague, the congressman from Texas, who asked why we weren't using our federal funds to promote the economic benefits of the American way of life, rather than exposing children to starving Eskimos. Politics aside, <clears throat> were the Sputnik reforms really designed only for the best and the brightest? That was not our experience. In fact, we learned that Manicarsa's study was very successful with what today we would call high-risk children. Not surprisingly, when you think about it, most urban kids grasp the significance of the Inuit struggle for survival more deeply than many of our suburban, suburban students. Indeed, I've met more than a few over the years who speak of their encounter with Manicors of Study as one of the most remarkable, memorable, and relevant experiences they had in school. So looking back half a century later, I think that the process of education and the curriculum reforms it envisioned still pose important questions for educators. First, how do we create a process of, of schooling that teaches students how to think rather than what to think? Second, how do we help the young to think deeply and in a disciplined way about the world in which we live and how we can improve it? And finally, how do we deal with the challenge of those who would equate intellectual development with the erosion of belief? Once when I was defending Man, of course, of study against two of its detractors on a radio, in a radio station in Phoenix, Arizona, my exasperated host could preserve his objectivity no longer. What I am trying to extract from you, Mr. Dow, is the admission that the most important thing to teach a child is faith. <laughs> my reply, or so I like to remember it, on, on Sundays perhaps, but the rest of the week, we should be encouraging children to doubt, to question, and to examine the world from many points of view. Today, I believe that, that more strongly than ever. Indeed, I suspect our survival as a species depends upon it. The process of education, man of course of study, and working with Jerome Bruner taught me to think that way. Thanks very much, Peter. I met you probably the same week that I met Jerry, 45 years ago. And I'll tell a secret just to people in this room. If you want to stay and continue looking young the way Peter does, just hang around Jerry. <laughs> and if you go sailing with him, it's a bonus. Um, the next speaker is Ronald Evans, who um, is in education at San Diego State University and has just published a book 
the hope for American school reform. Thank you. I'd like to ask a couple of volunteers to introduce me further by passing out these flyers. For my shameless, oh. shameless self promotion here, flyers. It'll introduce me and, and the work I've done. I'm here because I've written about the 60s era of school reform. And uh, luckily, uh, was granted a wonderful interview with Jerry in 2008. As a social studies teacher in the 1970s and early 80s, strongly influenced by the 60s and Jerry's ideas, I found that students were often excited by my experiments with inquiry teaching. I was given freedom to create interesting lessons and courses within broad parameters, to go for depth when warranted, to, and to engage students in wide-ranging activities. Like most school reforms, the new social studies had roots in the social context of its time, Cold War competition and criticisms of progressive education. The reform gained traction from Cold War manpower concerns, fears that the Soviets would overtake the United States in technological leadership. Those fears were confirmed by Sputnik in 1957, unleashing massive funds for school improvement. Reformers seized the opportunity to promote faith in the redemptive power of reason and to imbue a significant segment of school children with the power of disciplined thought. Following the Woods Hole Conference in 1959, Bruner argued that any child could learn the underlying and fundamental ideas of the disciplines at an age-appropriate level. Through the motivating process of discovery, students would gain understanding of concepts and, mode, and a mode of inquiry and gradually transfer habits of critical thinking to other areas. Zacharias summed up his hopes for reform with the mantra, observation, evidence, the basis for belief. Gradually, with the backing of big science and government, a curriculum reform that started in science and math morphed into a broad movement aimed at revolutionizing social studies. The 1962 meeting at Endicott House brought conflicting views to a head in reaction to Feldmesser's claim that we, could, we would make no progress until we slaughter the sacred cow of history. The discussion that followed led to the shared realization that the problem wasn't so much history versus social science as it was the way the subjects were typically taught in schools, with emphasis on a textbook and recitation. A short time later, Project Social Studies was officially launched. The projects and materials that emerged were pedagogically advanced, among the most intellectually engaging social studies materials ever created. They breathed new life into a field that had suffered harsh criticism and helped re-engage historians and social scientists with the schools. The current reform movement, focused on standards and testing, bears a few striking similarities to the curriculum reform of the 60s, along with some profound differences. Both reforms originated outside the education establishment and share similar assumptions on its poor quality. 60s reform was inspired by national security issues, led by federal government initiative and elite members of the academic community. In contrast, accountability reforms were inspired by a manufactured crisis centered on international economic competition and the desire of business to develop human capital and maintain global hegemony. Both movements share a top-down model as reformers focused on manipulating one key component of the education system. 60s reformers emphasized innovative materials and instruction. The current reform stresses accountability. 60s reform was theory-driven, suffused with inquiry and discovery. It sought to extend the church of reason from universities into schools. The current reform is efficiency oriented with theories of educational improvement drawn from business, rooted in Taylorism, with no comparable pedagogic theory at its core. Unfortunately, it is a reform in search of a theory and has led to the reification of teaching to the test. Theories and innovations of the past are of continuing relevance. Dewey, Bruner, and the reform movements they spawned have been marginalized by curriculum controversy, by the grammar of schooling, drilling children in a cultural orientation.
by social efficiency, tests and measurement, and by a focus on certainties, not doubts. Inquiry fosters doubt, while a strong segment of the public wants certainties. Hence, curriculum politics intervene. I'll finish with a brief quote from my interview with Jerry in 2008. Reflecting on Makos, Jerry lamented, that was how it ended, how it always ended. American education is about what you know, what you can achieve, and what you can be tested on. It didn't fit. Thanks very much, Ron. Um, hearing your presentation back to back with Peter makes me wonder to what extent these are purely American as opposed to things we might observe elsewhere as well. Perhaps that can be a subject for discussion later. The final uh, formal panelist in the first session is Patricia Greenfield, a psychologist from UCLA who um, was both a student of Jerry's as an undergraduate and as a graduate, and um, published with him uh, most notably in Studies in Cognitive Growth. Patty? Hi, everyone. Whoops. Is that good? Yeah. Well, I met Jerry Bruner in 1961, the year after the process of education was published, when, as a junior at Radcliffe College, I enrolled in his graduate seminar at Harvard. My classmates were the graduate students working on Jerry's seminal book on cognitive development, the collaborative work entitled Studies in Cognitive Growth. It was an exciting seminar that set my intellectual life course. Fast forward. Starting in 1999, I collaborated with Nancy Lutkehaus, an anthropologist at the University of Southern California, on a piece called From the Process of Education to the Culture of Education, an intellectual biography of Jerome Bruner's contributions to education. And this piece is the foundation for my remarks this afternoon. In October 2000, Jerry said, and I quote, I never felt I was going into education. If you didn't take account of this most powerful institution schooling, how could you talk, how could you talk about cognitive development? This quote expresses a link between the individual and the societal, between the cognitive and the cultural. Jerry's early forays into the world of education were based primarily on cognitive psychology, particularly cognitive development. Over time, his educational thinking became increasingly grounded in cultural psychology and anthropology, eventually leading to his book, The Culture of Education, in 1996. But that is a topic for another day. Let me now return to The Process of Education, the book whose 50th anniversary we're celebrating today. From an intellectual point of view, The Process of Education is a very structuralist account of education and cognitive development. The central question, and I quote from the book, is, what are the implications of emphasizing the structure of a subject, be it mathematics or history, emphasizing it in a way that seeks to give a student as quickly as possible a sense of the fundamental ideas of a discipline, unquote. But the idea was not just the external structure of the subject matter and the internal cognitive structure of the learner. The underlying notion of learning was a match between subject matter structure and learner cognitive structure. For Jerry, learner's cognitive structure was a matter of cognitive development. In the process of education, he wrote, quote, at each stage of development, the child has a characteristic way of viewing the world and explaining it to himself. The task of teaching a subject to a child at any particular age is one of representing the structure of that subject in terms of the child's way of viewing things." Unquote. 
There was also the idea in the process of education that it is best to start teaching any concept by using the most developmentally basic form of representation. What Jerry called in his theory of cognitive development, inactive representation. Representation through motor action. From there, one moves in pedagogy to his second cognitive level, iconic representation. And finally, to his third level, symbolic representation. The most memorable example of this curricular sequencing in the process of education is the balance beam, where the equation representing the balance point of the beam is first represented in action. The child places weights to make the beam balance, then represent, represented in iconic images, that is, the child draws a diagram of what he or she has done. And finally, it's represented by symbolic representation, where the child writes an equation using mathematical symbols to describe weights and distances from the fulcrum of the beam he has first balanced inactively through his motor action. In the process of education, this multimodal representation constitutes true understanding. The balance beam also illustrates that for Jerry, cognitive development and education were all of a piece. The role of structure in learning and how it may be made central to teaching is the first and foremost theme of the process of education. Jerry drew attention to the importance of the structure of the subject matter, the importance of the representational skills of the learner, and the importance of the fit between them. Knowledge is not merely performance, but understanding. Understanding consists of grasping the place of an idea or fact in some more general structure of knowledge. Through Jerome Bruner, the cognitive revolution hit educational thinking in the United States and around the world. And to close, I would like to present Jerry with a copy of this book that contains our intellectual biography of Jerry's career in education. The book is called Educational Psychology, A Century of Contributions, and it's a project of the Educational Psychology Division of the American Psychological Association, the same division Jerry paid $2 to join 50 years ago. Jerry's biography is featured in a section entitled Educational Psychology in the Modern Era. And all indications today, Jerry, are that you and the process of education will remain modern forever. Thanks very much, Patricia. Um, that's a wonderful achievement to be able to share with Jerry today. In a minute, we're going to open the floor up for comments. Um, and I'm going to be biased, because I hope some people who were present at the time that this work was done will speak up. My own list includes Pat Graham, Jerry Holton, Courtney Kasdan, Mickey Sands, Ben Snyder, Lauren Resnick, and I'm sure there are others as well. I'd love to hear from one or more of you. and take you to the microphone. You probably noticed that David Olson is not here. Um, we can all empathize with the note that he just sent. My flight to New York was canceled because of fog. <laughs> I'm terribly disappointed not to be among you, to give my love and respect to Jerry, to greet so many old friends, because David was there in the 60s and has been uh, Jerry's leading biographer, I would say. Uh, to meet the old and new members of the remarkable community that has formed around Jerry and his revolutionary work. Rest assured, I continue to fan the flame ignited in me 50 years ago by reading The Process of Education. No bit of fog can quench that flame. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a, a, a lengthier note from Carlina Rinaldi in Red Dromelia, and I think I'll ask uh, Eric to post that on the website that you all, that you all heard about this conference from. So the floor is open. We've got about 10 minutes for comments, reminiscence, uh, and uh, addenda. Pat.
It's a great privilege to be here, Jerry, to celebrate not only the process of education, but more importantly, you and your work and your life. And I only regret that I never got to go sailing with you. <laughs> In 1960, uh, when I read this book, I was a graduate student at Columbia writing about the history of the Progressive Education Association, a subject that did not fill me with glee. Uh, uh, the reading your book, however, uh, was extraordinary. And so but the question is, if you were approached now to write a book that would have the significance that the process of education has had for all of us. Who would you assemble at Woods Hole this summer to talk with you about that? You had an extraordinarily distinguished group of scientists, uh, some humanists, and even a couple of educators. Some, some chap from Baltimore who had just moved to Teachers College as dean. Uh, somebody from uh, ETS who used to do admissions at Yale or something. Uh, uh, the, uh, but if you were to convene a group at Woods Hole this summer, who are the kinds of people whom you would like to have to write, to help you write the kind of book that you would now write 50 years later? I think this is probably an opportunity for you not to answer right now, but to include this in your remarks later. Thank you. Great. That's Patricia Graham, known to many of you, who was the dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, the president of the Spencer Foundation, and a leading historian of education, and a friend of many of us. Um, thank you, Pat. Dan? Dan Slobin. I came even earlier. I met you, Jerry, in 1960 as a fresh graduate student. And uh, there were two books at that time, and I think we should acknowledge both of them. There were two slim books from Harvard University Press, and the other one that impressed me just as much was called Essays for the Left Hand. And I've, I've read it many times, and it occurs to me now that we're in a position of putting the left and the right hands together. Because what the Essays for the Left Hand showed me was that you can be a scientist and still look at the aesthetic and cultural products of humanity from a, a point of view that's both philosophically, personally, emotionally moving and part of your quest for understanding cognition and society and education. So thank you for doing both of those and for being my mentor ever since. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Courtney? Courtney Kasdan, professor of education at Harvard. I don't know if I ever told you, Jerry, that uh, it was the process of education that really sent me back to graduate school uh, in general, and specifically to Harvard because I read it in the public library. Uh, it must have been just when it came out in 1960, um, because 60, 61 was my last public school teaching year in Stratford, Connecticut. And I read it in the public library in Bridgeport. And it was just, the world opened, uh, the world of ideas. Um, and I re read very soon after that um, the book by Vygotsky that you have an introduction to. I think that was 62 uh, that that first came out, also Harvard Press. Um, and that, in substance, really had more influence on me than the process of education because, of course, it was more on language. And um, when I reread, skimmed the process of education, um, thinking of today, I, uh, there's not so much on language uh, as there is on the kind of structural um, 
and representations that uh, um, Patty talked so well about. But I thank you for, um, for both of them, as well as for much else once I got to Harvard and had the chance to work with you. Yeah. Thanks. While, while you're walking up to the microphone, um, uh, let me just say that Courtney reminds us of the way, Jerry, you introduced so many ideas and people. I mean, for most of us, Piaget, Vygotsky, so much of literary theory. Jay? Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Jay Featherstone. Uh, as an undergraduate at Harvard, I started to work with the curriculum projects that have been mentioned and uh, uh, met Peter Dow and um, many other people, including Jerry in those projects. And uh, I, I had written, a, was going to write in a year or so, an undergraduate thesis on Dewey. Uh, and I was really uh, actually blown away uh, by some contemporaries, not just dusty progressives actually thinking that children are intellectuals uh, and, that, and that that is actually the heart of school reform and, and school possibilities. Uh, curriculum, too, as thinking and ideas, the having in Eleanor Duckworth's wonderful phrase, the having of wonderful ideas, as sort of at the core of, of what we should be doing in curriculum. And then also, uh, I didn't know any history then, uh, much history, but the idea that university uh, academics had something to offer uh, in education, not just writing uh, lucrative textbooks, uh, but actually uh, working with teachers. And some of the projects did this more brilliantly than others. My nomination for the most brilliant in actually engaging scholars and teachers together uh, would be David and Francis Hawkins uh, and the work that they did at el the elementary social studies. Um, and I think there's actually a history to be written further about some of the different projects there. The one thing I want to say is that each of those propositions, that children are intellectuals, that curriculum should be about thinking, and that university scholars have something to add to day-to-day -day classroom uh, practice and not just sort of remote, um, you know, re remote ideas uh, are actually fairly scarce today and growing much scarcer in schools dealing with poor children. And the one thing that stands out most in rereading the process of education, um, there are a few mentions, but, but how uh, little attention it pays to what Jerry has later often looked at, which is inequality uh, in our society and the role of differential fates uh, in children as culture learners. Uh, and I think, you know, the, what, um, when I read the book, uh, you know, maybe a month ago, uh, again, uh, it seemed to me that that last point is the one that most needs saying again and again right now, that, that the radical inequality of this society now makes the hope for classrooms where children are intellectuals uh, very, very remote. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Jay Featherstone is reminding us that while this book came out in 1960 or 61, it of course was a book written at the end of the 50s. And that time was very different, and there were many blind spots in America, including in Woods Hole. Uh, and Jerry was one of the people whose eyes began to open soon thereafter to things which were not as manifest in the 50s as they were in the Kennedy, Johnson, Martin Luther King era. Time for uh, one more, but only one more comment. Jerry Holton. Uh, Jerry Holton is a historian of science and was involved both in the early Project Physics, um, and then was the often unacknowledged author of a Nation at Risk. Jerry? Uh, first of all, congratulations to Jerry Bruner for all that he has done. 
And uh, then very briefly, since we're at the end of the hour, uh, let me share a paradox with you that I don't know how to resolve. What did it take for Bruno to write the book? Well, many things. All these wonderful people coming together and uh, his work on it and his learning. But it also took Sputnik. It uh, was a sequence, a consequence of a historic event, which uh, in retrospect, Sputnik was a kind of a hysteria, but a very fruitful one for many of us. Nevertheless, it took that change in history. And if you think of these other similar uh, advances, think, for example, of general education, which was uh, born out of World War II. As Conan told me, the reason he was so deeply engaged in it was that he had discovered while in Washington during the war that the generals knew how to fight, but they didn't know why. Namely, to save Western civilization. I'm sorry to use that term now. It's a little in disrepute, but in those days, this was very important. And you think of the... Uh, you think of, uh, well, Project Physics itself was a child of Sputnik in its way. And then uh, the nation at risk in the 1980s, that was really Reagan trying to abolish the Department of Education and Terrell Bell trying to save it. So once more, it was a byproduct of something else. And in each case, they decayed with a certain half-life. That is, as Jerry Bruno says himself in the book, uh, by the 1970s, you couldn't raise money for teacher education, which was the case for Project Physics too, and it dribbled down. There are still wonderful people doing wonderful things with it, but not the way it used to be. So here's the paradox. Does it really take historic events for us to get together again at that level? And how can we prevent the decay? You're about to see a seamless transition from panel one to panel two. Um, and while that seamless transition occurs before your eyes, I hope you will join me in thanking both the wonderful commentators from the audience and our perfectly timed panel. The uh, 16th president of NYU has just taken the podium. Please <laughs> welcome the one and only. Hey, wait, wait a minute, did I miss, did I get the wrong notice or? Why aren't you all dressed like this? I don't understand, I don't understand. I, I, I understand that uh, I'm simply the interstices between two brilliant panels. Uh, so I just, I just wanted to take a minute. Clearly, uh, I have obligations. Uh, we have our distinguished teachers' dinners tonight, and then I, I'm supposed to make an introduction uptown at one of these events. Uh, so I, I couldn't be here but for a picosecond. But uh, I, I wanted to be here, Jerry, because of the specialness of the event. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, 
that we're celebrating something that happened 50 years ago that continues to have the power that your work does. Uh, I want to make it a little bit more human. So uh, when you mention the year 1958, especially today, the day after last night, Tom Oliphant and Doris Kern Goodwin and I in a classroom up on the second floor spoke about the tectonic change that happened in the world between 1957 and 1958 when a man named, excuse me, O'Malley <laughs> moved, uh, moved the Dodges to the plastic city of the West, <laughs> thereby beginning a kind of concatenation of events that, that made uh, the assassinations and Vietnam and Watergate and the collapse of morality among the Catholic hierarchy and the death of corporate America and the fall of university presidents. All of that became inevitable in 1957 because if an institution as important and powerful as the Dodges could die. But the world operates on a kind of yin and yang principle. And for every depraved and venal and retrogressive act, there needs to be a leap forward as we move to point omega. And in the balancing of the world, thank God, in 1958, you came along with the process of education and you began to change the way we thought about ourselves and the way we think. And I remember the day that Tony and Peggy walked into my office and said, that there was a chance that you could join us in this community. And I remember the first day that I saw, as close of this, um, that wonderful smile. And I know that every single time, no matter how deep the valley, every single time you've walked into my life, it has made my life better, as well as my mind. So I just wanted to come by at a very personal level to say thank you for being part of this community, not for, not for all of the five decades in the flesh, but of course you were part of all of us for all of those five decades in that wine. God bless you and I love you. Very difficult to follow <laughs> John Sexton, but we're going to try. Good afternoon, my name is Marcelo Suarez Orozco. I'm a professor at the Steinhardt uh, School and I'm delighted to be um, the uh, uh, voice of restraint for the second part of, uh, of our panel. Um, I'm an anthropologist uh, by training, and uh, what I have in common with Jerry is that after many, many uh, years at Harvard, uh, I too moved up uh, to join NYU. So, um, but the nature of the kinship and, and the relationship is of a, of a grandparental uh, sort. Uh, I was an undergraduate, uh, Dan Slobin won't remember any of this, at Berkeley uh, many, many, many years ago, and I first read Jerry uh, in uh, my undergraduate psychology uh, uh, courses at Tolman, uh, at Tolman Hall, so there is a, there is a complex uh, kinship uh, here. But, of course, Jerry's um, echo has been very, very powerful and has been heard throughout the social sciences, the humanities, the law, and many, many other uh, domains. Um, the process of education, uh, in a way, reminds me of what was, 
one set of, uh, at, at about the same time the book was, was um, released, what was said of uh, Cuba, uh, a little country with a big, big country's echo, with a big, big country's uh, impact in the world, in the world stage. Uh, the Process of Education is a book that uh, has um, endured in the grand tradition of the important books in the social sciences in the 20th, uh, in the 20th century. Um, I'm going to be uh, extremely uh, economical now and turn to uh, our first uh, uh, discussion this, this afternoon, uh, maybe a great, great grandchild then of, uh, of Jerry Bruner around Josh Aronson from the Steinhardt School at NYU. It, it's a huge honor to be included um, in, this, in these two panels. Um, I'm a psychologist, and I wanted to pitch my comments at the uh, younger folks in the audience, so I'll look past the first row. Um, <laughs> you know, Jerry Bruner was such a towering figure in psychology when I was a graduate student that when I heard that there was a book called The Process of Education by a guy named Jerry Bruner. I assumed it was a different Jerry Bruner. Um, there were two Jerome Singers, so it was not out of the question. Um, I was trained as a social psychologist by one of Jerry's students at Harvard, um, Edward E. Jones, who I love dearly, who himself became a towering figure in social psychology. And in my field, Jerry was regarded as instrumental in the cognitive revolution. His studies, like none before them, demonstrated both the importance of and the feasibility of studying how expectations, meaning making, and wishes could change basic perceptual processes. Now, um, this, is, this came to be called the new look in perception. And so students, my, I remember my fellow students and I just marveling at the studies he did where you would get a poor kid, poor kids and a rich kids, and you'd ask them to draw a quarter. And the poor kids would draw the quarter bigger than the rich kids. Did I get that right? How cool was that? Because in their minds, it represented something much bigger. Um, we marveled also at the way he wrote, which is not, <laughs> let's face it, not, something that psychologists do well all, all the time. Uh, so he was a breath of fresh air in so many ways. Um, and so I can remember countless chapters and articles that would begin with a Bruner quote. Here's my favorite. The most characteristic thing about mental life, over and, above, over and beyond the fact that one apprehends the events of the world around one, is that one constantly goes beyond the information given. You could title, I think people have titled books beyond the information given. For you young folks, it's probably hard for you to imagine a time when we didn't see it this way. When you didn't, when, when the idea that wishes and uh, ideas and the, your perceptual set could change the way you saw the world. But that was the world before Bruner came along. And so he ushered in uh, an era when thinkers weren't seen either as dutiful clerks recording the events that they saw, like a camera, or as, as Freud saw them as people wrestling with these subconscious demons or thoughts about sex, um, or a, a responder responding like a, a machine to, to a, the stimulus conditions of the environment. So Jerry changed all that, and he helped uh, introduce the field of psychology to the active interpreter who resolves ambiguities, makes educated guesses about events that cannot directly be observed, who makes associations about causal relations. For many psychologists at the time, I wasn't there, but I know a lot who were. It was like finding an oasis in a desert called behaviorism. Um, it was. 
excuse me. My mentor, Ned Jones, after winning another in a series of uh, big time awards, read me the little biography that they had written about him. And it said that Jones had been touched by the brush of Jerome Bruner. <laughs> this clearly made him as happy and proud as I had ever seen him unless he was with one of his children. Um, I think it almost made up for the, for the worst moment of his life up until that point, which is when on a camping trip with Jerry, he dropped a canoe on his advisor's toe. <laughs> yeah. After graduate school, when I was interested in learning about education, I had lunch with Lee Shulman, and I asked him, what should I read? I, I don't know anything about education. And, um, and he handed me the process of education. Great. Um, my time is up. Uh, two more minutes. Isn't Jerry, isn't Jerry worth it, ladies and gentlemen? So it's really remarkable to read the process of education now and realize that we're still wrestling with these same questions 50 years later. That's the thing that hits me over the head. Uh, what what shall we teach and to what end? How shall we approach the learning gaps between groups of learners? It was in there. And at what age should we introduce particular concepts? Clearly, we've made great process on the research side, but the application has been lacking. Um, having just come here from a school today, not far from here, and watching what looks like a TV depiction of disorder and children actively trying not to learn, it was diff I had Jerry in my mind, and I felt cognitive dissonance, that we have not realized the dream and the blueprint that he laid out for the field. And I'd like to finish by, uh, I, I think one of the things that Jerry said is that psychology should be about meaning. It should be about meaning. That's the central task. And I think that could be said for the schools today. And there's half of the children are getting the Bruner treatment, half are in a meaningless, um, wasteland. I'd like to finish by thanking Jerry for his work, his influence on social and cognitive psychology, and for bringing his insights and timeless questions to the field of education. Whether you know it or not, young people, all of you have been touched by the brush of Jerry Bruner. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful reflection. The more we can keep to our time limit, the more Jerry will have time uh, 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 afterwards to uh, touch us all. Um, our next speaker is Hubert Diassi, a retired professor uh, at the, the Science Education at the City University of New York. Uh, thank you, it's an honor to be here and uh, to talk about uh, in this case, science education, as it relates to Jerry Bruner's work. But I do want to mention that in the fall of 1961, I became a brand new graduate student at the University of Illinois. And uh, if you read uh, the preface and uh, the list on the book, The Process of Education, you will uh, realize that uh, some of the professors from the University of Illinois who were at the Woods Hole Conference played a very effective and uh, strong part in uh, the preparation of the reports. I, I, I also want you to know that as soon as I got to the University of Illinois, I got immersed in this book called The Process of Education, but I want to add that it was not by choice, and I'm glad I was forced to read it. And it didn't take any force for me to go ahead and read it many, many times again. I wish to talk very briefly about a major part of the current vision of science education. That part is to promote understanding of science and how students can come to that understanding. I chose this part of the vision because it evokes a suggestion made by Jerry in the process of education. Pretty early in the book, let me read the suggestion. Intellectual activity everywhere is the same, whether at the frontier of knowledge or in a third grade classroom. The difference is in degree, not in kind. 
The schoolboy learning physics is a physicist, and it is easier for him to learn physics behaving like a physicist. The first part of that suggestion about uh, children having the capacity to reason in, in sophisticated way has been confirmed. Uh, stud, uh, summaries of studies published by the National Research Council of the National Academies all show general agreement with that statement. I just want to quote how it was put in one of those reports. Children from all backgrounds and all socioeconomic levels show evidence of sophisticated reasoning skills. Although they may lack knowledge and experience, they can and do engage in a wide range of subtle and complex reasoning processes. These processes can form the underpinnings of scientific thinking." End quote. There's also general agreement that, and I quote once again from numerous reports from the National Academies, that science is both a body of knowledge that represents current understanding of natural systems and the process whereby that body of knowledge has been established and is being continually extended, refined, and revised. Both elements are essential. One cannot make progress in science without understanding of both. Although there's agreement on those two points I've mentioned, there are questions that still remain regarding, regarding the kinds of abilities students need to develop in order to master these two inextricably linked elements of science that I've just mentioned. For this very short talk, I'd just like to mention only the abilities without referring to the educational context and experiences necessary to develop them. The National Science Education Standards, which by the way are not standards in the ordinary sense of the word, but they are a vision or an image of science education. 15 years ago, identified and described and illustrated at least six abilities necessary to successfully do the kind of science I've alluded to. And I'll just list some of them at the high school level. One is to identify questions and concepts that guide scientific investigations. For example, students or children are interested in where do clouds come from? Where does the rain come from? They also have to have the ability to formulate and revise scientific explanations and models using logic and evidence. They already do that in their own way. So we have to build on what they bring to us. And then they have to develop the ability to communicate and defend a scientific argument. Those are the three I'll just read. But I would like to underline one or two things about them. All of these abilities are action-based. And they all fully engage the intellect. And they are all potentially child-friendly. However. These abilities are being questioned now as we talk. Later in the year, the national academies are going to publish a framework for science education, which will highlight what they call practices of science. Those practices, I hope, will not destroy our focus <coughs> on abilities. The last sentence I want to make is, what all this means is that we have not finished the assignment Jerry Bruner gave us 50, 50 years ago. And that is, what do we really mean when we talk about students doing science? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I want turn the floor to uh, Elizabeth Knoll. Uh, Elizabeth is a the senior editor for the Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard University Press. She must have been like two when the process of education <laughs> was published, so I don't think she can claim any 
I was four. Uh. <laughs> so I am not someone who can be here to say that the process of education changed my life when it first came out because I was in nursery school. Um, and I cannot claim to have been the editor for this book, although I certainly wish I had been. What I can say is that I had never heard of Jerome Bruner when I was an undergraduate. Um, and I was tremendously interested in psychology, but not at all in the kind of psychology that was taught in my undergraduate school, which had mostly to do with rats, so far <laughs> as I could tell. In fact, in the basement, there was the chilling sight of enormous bags of Purina rat chow um, in the hallway outside the cages. This put me off psychology pretty badly. But then in 1977, I happened to read in the Times Literary Supplement when I was 21, an essay called Psychology in the Image of Man, which was later republished by Harvard University Press in the book Essays for My Left Hand by Jerome Bruner. I had never heard of Jerome Bruner, but he was the Watts Professor of Psychology at Oxford, so I gathered he was an important guy. And this essay was wonderful. This essay which talked about what psychology ought to be how psychology should be connected to anthropology, to history, to the study of language, and not squeeze its entire subject into attempts to emulate some rather thin idea of the natural sciences, was music to my ears. So that when, 20 years later, I turned up at Harvard University Press as the psychology and education editor, one of the great privileges for me was to be the editor who got to work with Jerome Bruner, my hero. I can't say very much about the impact of the book on the field, but I can speak as a publisher about what the impact of the book has been on us. It has been very nice, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you all know, I think, What, what from really matters in education. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I think, from the program that the book has sold in its very editions and its various permutations over the years um, some 400,000 copies. That's, I think, in all languages. That's not only our edition. But what I'd like to emphasize is how steadily this book has sold and how long it has lasted. The revised edition, the paperback that everyone has on, on the table here, Eric Wanner's copy, for instance, that edition was revised in 1977, the year that I discovered Jerry Bruner as an undergraduate. And even then, it has, that particular edition has sold almost 170,000 copies. Um, the book continues to sell beautifully. It has sold um, almost 7,000 copies in the last five years, which for a book that is 50 years old is pretty good. We're very happy about that. Uh, I will say that we also have it available as an e-book if any of you want to read it on your Kindle uh, or your iPhones. Jerry told me several months ago that he was planning to take next year off from teaching so that he could not retire, take a year off from teaching it's because he has another book he wants to work on. As the editor at Harvard University Press, I certainly hope he gives it to us and I hope it lasts as long as the process of education. Thank you, Elizabeth. Make Elizabeth, make sure he signs a dotted line before uh, the evening is, uh, is over. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we turn to a historian, uh, Alan Lagerman of Bard College. As I'm sure is the case for many people in this room, I've read the process of education for many years, many times. But I found that going back to it just before this meeting was a total delight. It doesn't lose anything. If Jerry had written only the first sentences of this wonderful little book, he would have deserved extremely high marks for both the grace of his phrasing and the wisdom of his ideas. Recall just the first two sentences. Each generation gives new form to the aspirations that shape education in its time. What may be emerging as a mark of our generation is a widespread renewal of concern for the quality and intellectual aims of education, but without abandonment of the idea that education should serve as a means of training well-balanced citizens for a democracy. 
Jerry's right, I think, that in this country, generations are de defined by the aspirations they hold for education. In 1960, when this book first appeared, there was a wide consensus emerging among leaders in education that the primary challenge facing the United States was finding ways to promote excellence, but also to advance equality. Neither alone was sufficient. Those aspirations for education were supported by a larger view of society that was optimistic, expansive, and public-spirited. Ask what you can do for your country, JFK admonished us, while Martin Luther King dared to dream of a beloved community in which all would recognize one another as equals. There were undersides to the 1960s, but the contrast between the ideals of the world in which Jerry published The Process of Education and those predominating today is not lovely. Economic contractions, pressures caused by globalization, and increasing political conservatism, among many other things, have given rise to a drive toward the privatization of vital services and have shattered belief in in a common public good. Inevitably, too, because we seem to have lost faith in the communal priorities to Tocqueville identified with the principle of self-interest rightly understood, our conception of educational purpose has become sadly constricted. We hear little today about high intellectual aims and democracy. President Obama favors college for all, but does so in hope of commercial competitiveness. The current federal education law mandates adequate yearly progress, but only in basic skills. Even in the domain of civil rights law as applied to education, the most promising approach pertains merely to ensuring state provisions for an adequate education. The process of education is much to say about teaching and learning on the individual level. But my hope is that by celebrating this book, which resonates with a deep faith in democracy and a learnedness that exemplifies intellectual excellence, we can also think about teaching and learning in larger, more social and political contexts. How can we acquire the sensitivities and vocabularies necessary to speak across difference? What must be done to nurture belief in the value of living in a society based on mutual rights and obligations, rather than one primarily <clears throat> driven by personal accumulation? Thanks in part to the process of education and the many lines of research and development it stimulated, we have learned, not enough, but a great deal about individual and social cognition in the young. While continuing that work, we must also study teaching and learning aimed at the civic renewal that must precede and guide a return to educational ideals that promise more than adequacy. The process of education brought much good in its wake 50 years ago. May it continue to do so for 50 years more. And I made my time. Thank you so much, Alan. You set a historic record by keeping us in uh, time. So we turn now to the West Coast. Um, uh, Roy P. from Stanford University. Thank you. It's my enormous pleasure tonight to be honoring Jerry and his contributions to education launched with publication of the process of education from the famed Woods Hole Conference. I very much enjoyed working with Jerry at Oxford in the mid-70s on the development of negation and early child language and thought, but then moving on to 30 years that I think he helped inspire in studying uh, learning and, and education technology designs for children. My rereading of the process was extremely refreshing. This is a revolutionary document with great continued relevance for advancing the sciences and practices of education. For me, its most powerful message is the challenge to the concept of learner readiness, proposing principles of spiral curricula that could deepen knowledge by incorporating more knowledge structure and connections and new visitations to the same topics across grade levels. 
And the themes at the core of his essay are vibrant in our graduate programs and learning and in education, in our teacher education programs, which have not been spoken about much yet, in our designs for curriculum and for education technologies that empower the teacher and the learner. And I want to share observations on three topics. First, what is flowered from these writings? I think this focus on structure is so important. Not only structure in the disciplines, but the structure and coherency in the knowledge structures of children. The cognitive sciences have left us with no doubt that well-structured knowledge is intrinsic to the nature of expertise. That insight is manifest in the extensive global research now in what Jerry calls the fundamental and what we now often call the core in understanding of the disciplines. Look at Project 2061 from uh, AAAS, the new framework for K-12 science education, the new standards, and the international comparative studies like TIMS that compare curriculum and the achievements that come out otherwise. We also have a great deal of progress in learning progressions for specific topics across the grade levels. This is in the spiral curriculum tradition. This inspirational message about readiness also has challenged many scholars who work to augment learning and reasoning with computing technologies over the last few decades. We're all seeking to come up with radically new designs, such as simulations, multiple linked representations for getting at calculus in the upper elementary school, or new expressive multimedia for children to create for a global web audience, believing that they're possible of things that people have not thought before. In teacher education, we now call out, as Lee Shulman does, for pedagogical content knowledge. What is this? It's integrating learning theory with the classroom practices that help children build disciplinary understanding. Secondly, what was importantly missing in that book that we consider vital today and attend to now more than then? So the cognitive revolution that Jerry pioneered at Harvard with his colleagues and students has led to, of course, many fundamental achievements that we synthesized in the National Academy's volume, How People Learn, in 99. They've also been applied to designing many new curricula for fostering deeper disciplinary understanding. This cognitive emphasis has expanded during these last two decades with complementary social and cultural emphases, such as those on the mutually constitutive nature of the developing knowledge and the developing identity of the learner. Think of yourself as a math person, changes the things you choose to do. And also in how social cultural patterns of classroom discourse may either open up or close down learning opportunities and learning pathways from even the best design curricula. We also know from a range of studies, from Scribner, Lave, Sachs, Venice here and many others, that uh, there's a vital social nature to learning in informal environments that we need to heed and build on in the classroom. What Louise Mall calls the funds of knowledge, our teachers need to understand how to leverage these funds that children bring with them to school from their families, communities, their hobbies. And this report was simply moot on this as the key research hadn't been conducted. We also presume the importance more today than then, I think, of a systemic approach to conceptualizing education in terms of needed alignments and standards, curriculum, assessments, and for policies and programs of teacher and leadership development, aspiring towards a more coherent, measurable, and improvable system. This is something we talk about in the new National Education Technology Plan. Now, I've not said anything about technology yet. But there have been stunning technology advances uh, in virtually every sector of society, with two million people on the internet, five million cell phones, and the new learning platform many of us are designing for is in the pocket. We also have a large growing science on how to do that. What's been lost? And that's my last minute. I was really struck by the nearly equivalent emphases on math and science and the humanities, arts, and the social sciences in the process. There is no question that STEM has today become the dominant area of national investment, in the sciences of learning and in the creation of new curricula. I was moved, Jerry even talks about proposes that we study children's conceptions of the human tragedy in literature. And this feels so far away from the work on learning progressions in science and mathematics. He says, the theater, the arts, music, and humanities as presented in the schools and college will need our fullest support. We shall have to maintain and nurture a vigorous pluralism in America. Amen. I also don't see the same enthusiasm today for intuitive thinking that a whole chapter is about. And I think part of that is that we do have these understanding, uh, understandings of qualitative advances uh, that don't require a quantitative model-based, symbolic equation-based understanding. But I think you had a richer sense of intuition uh, for calling for research. Something more like Pierce's abduction or hunched-based reasoning seemed to be at the core of what you were looking at. And that, I think, is very much worth revisiting. And finally, I think what's been lost is momentum. The sense in your chairman's report of the inevitability of a national coordination coming from a clarion call 
in the service of bringing scientists of learning together with the minds producing the best science to create new and ever better curricula and instruction to serve all students, not only a meritocracy. Thank you, Jerry, for your leadership, for your inspiring clarity in expressing the ideals of an optimistic generation, for equitably providing for all learners high quality, comprehensible instruction, for broad and deep understanding and uses of disciplinary knowledge. We're partway on the road to realizing these ideals, and I for one hope we do not need another Sputnik to strive for them as a nation, but will instead rise to the challenge because we can and should. Thank you so much. In thinking through um, what's different uh, today than when the book was, um, was first published, um, new information, communication, and, and media technologies are very, very obvious. The integration and disintegration of markets from the time you woke up this morning to the time you go to bed tonight, a trillion dollars will cross national boundaries with the architectures of the nation state essentially uh, irrelevant to the dynamics of global capital. And along with these two formations, really uh, the most significant demographic transformation taking place in nearly every high income country in the 21st century. Very, very different demography moving forward. We're in a city where today children from approximately 190 different countries got up, got into subways, and went to school. This never happened before in the history of the world. One city encompasses the entire range of the human condition. So the three M's of the world moving forward, media, integrated, uh, markets, and a massive migration. The children in our schools today are in fundamental ways facing a challenge that education systems in the high income countries really have never met before. How do we educate all children, more diverse children than ever before, to higher levels of competence. And at a time of cultural malaise and economic disequilibria, I think that the process of education is a fundamental beacon to think through the challenges of this new world. Last but not least, um, I'm very happy to introduce Eric Warner, president of the Russell Sage Foundation. Eric. Thanks, Marcelo. I'm really thrilled to be part of this celebration of my friend Jerry Bruner's work. I don't think Jerry and I have ever been sailing together, but we've emptied a lot of bottles together, and, <laughs> and very good bottles, I might say. And we've carried on a conversation for four decades now that has enriched my life immeasurably. Let me begin with a confession from my somewhat distant, perched somewhat distant from education, I have only the vaguest idea of how the process of education finds its place in current debates about educational practice and reform. But I know that it is a book that remains an influence on all of us, that it inaugurated the field of curriculum research, and that it did this not only by what it has to say, but by the manner in which it says it. The current educational arguments seem dispirited to me and dispiriting in so many ways. They are all about limits and incentives and boundary conditions. We debate the effects of class size, expenditure per pupil, high stakes testing, teacher evaluations and accountability. We fight holy wars about vouchers and charter schools and teachers unions. What goes on in the classroom gets much less press. Of course, what goes on in the classroom is crucial, especially now. American schools, like American society itself, have been riven by 30 years of inexorably rising economic inequality. Although we count on public education to provide some approximation to equal opportunity in life for all American children, the facts on the ground come nowhere near approximating this ideal. 
intergenerational mobility, the chance to get ahead of where your parents lie in life's lottery, is lower in the U.S. than in any other advanced country in which it has been measured. And some studies suggest that mobility is declining further in the U.S. as inequality continues to rise. What is crucially needed are resources, both curricular as well as material, to help disadvantaged schools resist these trends more effectively. We need curricula for schools which face high student turnover rates, hard-pressed families, serious security threats, and often a high incidence of non-English speaking students. What you can teach under these conditions and the ways you can teach it may be quite different than in schools and neighborhoods with more advantaged, stable, and well-supported students. The process of education speaks to us from a simpler time, or at least it seemed simpler. The problem they were counteracting, the <clears throat> The problem uh, was not, so that they were counteracting, was not social disadvantage, which was barely acknowledged, but teaching science more effectively in the wake of the Sputnik shock to American complacency. Nevertheless, the book has a lot to say to us, that education is an endlessly intriguing puzzle, that it warrants the attention of the best minds we can bring to it, that it requires a profound understanding of the deep structure of the subject, that the mastery of concepts requires artful nourishment of students' intuitions, and that learning is an active, exploratory, and above all, a joyful process. It is this enlarged sense of the possible that makes the reading of the process of education such an inspiration for so many of us. It's the same buoyant feeling that one inevitably carries away from any conversation with Jerry. The sense that there are indeed difficult problems in education and in life, but that we can make real headway if we think together seriously, profoundly, but also playfully and optimistically about their solution. I think it is this stance, this style, this attitude towards education and towards life that shines through the process of education and continues to attract wonderful young minds to the field and in spite of everything, gives us the cheerful courage to push ahead. Thank you so much, um, Eric, for bringing joy and uh, optimism into a conversation uh, on education, which is uh, rare uh, today. Um, we've managed to keep um, uh, the time within the, the constraints, so I would like to now invite uh, questions, comments, uh, and the great Rick Schrader, the voice of cultural psychology in anthropology, has volunteered to speak. Rick, yeah. University of Chicago, Human Development. Thank you, Marcelo. I don't have to introduce myself. In 1967, I took a course um, called Cultural Psychology at Harvard. I was a graduate student in the Department of Social Relations. Jerome Bruner was the professor. Ken Kay, Jerry Anglin were the TAs. And I could list a vast fellowship of undergraduates and graduate students in that course who were inspired by that experience and went on to do remarkable things. Um, Pat Graham asked Jerry a question, and I, I want to ask a question. There's a Nietzschean aphorism which goes, Part from your cause as soon as it triumphs. And Jerry is often described as one of the fathers of the cognitive revolution, yet as many of you know, in recent decades he has emphasized the study of meaning in psychology. He's always talked about going beyond the information given. He's become an interpretivist, much more in the hermeneutic tradition, I think, than in the cognitive revolution tradition. So my question is, and he's talked about this, how early on did you begin to have trepidations about the cognitive revolution? If we dated the cognitive revolution from 58, 59, 60, somewhere in there, a lot of trends were coming together, but when did you get nervous? <laughs> um, 
That's my question. So, it, since Margaret Mead is not with us, it, of course, it, it, it's up to another anthropologist to ask the impolite uh, question. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, do you want to do you want to answer now, Jerry, or do you want to, or should we wait and perhaps you can respond? Uh, we will put it in context when the, when when time uh, comes. Please. My name is Pim Leefeld from the Netherlands. Um, I came to know Jerry when I was invited to be a fellow at the Center for Cognitive Studies long, long ago. Um, it was directed by Jerry and by George Miller, and that year changed my life. It also eventually caused the establishment of the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And I mention that because Jerry agreed to become the first chair of our, our research council. That has been essential in the development of the Institute. Jerry, with his slanted view, would lift up any discussion of how to proceed. We were not moving, we were leaping. Hmm. The title of this panel is Education in the US Today. <clears throat> we could have organized a third panel, Education in Europe this, uh, Today. And I can only from experience tell you that Jerry's inspiration is very, very much around everywhere. This, the, the academies of science have combined in Europe to develop primary education uh, and in particular this idea of the child being a scientist. That is Jerry's idea and it is very, very much alive in Europe at the moment. Thank you, Jerry, for your inspiration at all these levels. Thank you so much. So, Elizabeth, there you have it. The sun never sets on the process of education. Yes, please. So we can bring religion into the conversation. It was God's idea. What a shy crowd. Next question, comment? Please. How do we feel about the world? So, uh, Jerry, the purposes of education, so we have an, an Aristotelian purpose, the eidemonic ideal of the flourishing of a child. We have the idea of education as providing the tools that are fundamental for civic engagement in a democratic space. And we have, finally, the triumphalistic idea that coincides with the rise of uh, economics as the hegemonic discipline, discipline guiding how we think about education, education qua the labor market. So here we have three very different ideas, and I think the process of education uh, goes a long way to help us navigate, if we want to use the sailing metaphor, through those often contradicting currents. But I will uh, perhaps now turn the floor over to Jerry so that he can again touch us all. Jerry Bruner. Oh, 
Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be here and grateful to all of you for taking part in this celebration um, of the 50th birthday of the process of education. My God. <laughs> um, now, so let me bring this lovely event to some sort of conclusion by talking a little bit first about how, would that one be turned on? Uh, how, how, the, uh, how the process of education came into being, which still surprises me. What do I do? How to stay right there? Put it closer, there we are. How the process of education came into being and where things are today, a very different picture. Well, the process of education, you'll recall, was in some sense a response, in a sense, in the Cold War. The Russians had just launched Sputnik, as various of you have mentioned, the first space shot. It came to us with dismay, since we thought that we were miles ahead of the Russians, miles ahead of them in technological know-how and also in spunk. <laughs> what in the world went wrong? Now, the interesting thing was, the first conjecture was that our schools had done a lousy job at teaching science in America. What an astonishing conclusion to come to. Um, so anyway, so our physicists and our chemists and our mathematicians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, began bringing together committees and study groups to rethink how we taught science in America. That was what was at fault. The Physical Science Study Committee, I think, was the first of these. I was fairly close to it because it was born at MIT shortly after that Sputnik launch that various of you have mentioned along the way. Gerald Zacharias, a man of enormous intelligence and hottest of tempers, was the head of it. And he was going to get that thing ahead or damn your hide. Um, then the National Academy of Sciences got into the act almost immediately afterward and set, set itself up a, some kind of a committee that was to concern itself with, quote, national defense, as it was then called. And, brought together a most stellar group of some of our leading chemists and physicists and thises and thats uh, to concern itself with that at the National Academy. Now, some of the people who were involved in all this happened to be close friends of mine. I was just a psychologist who was sort of working away on perception. Um, some of them were trying to fight I, I was at that particular point also trying to fight the stimulus response theory, the Skinner box and all that stuff. Um, and, um, but somehow concerned with the restructure of reality, I hadn't thought about this in connection with schools. Schools was the last of my thoughts at that point. So how to get, I, I was, I have to confess, working with rats. I got a lot, of, lot out of rats, too. Don't, <laughs> don't, think, don't think you don't learn something from rats. You, you learn it in the laboratory, but also when you take the, the, your favorite rats and bring them home after the experiment to your kids uh, to play with, you discover that the rats around the house get a lot smarter than rats in a lab. And uh, I used to ask why. You know the answer. Um, I used to bring those rats home and uh, think of the way in which you would transform psychology if after they'd been home with my kids for a couple of months you brought them back into a lab. It would have been a very different kind of story. So I, I began thinking about what in the world was this business that you put them through along the way earlier on? And what if you put our own kids through some of that kind of thing? So. Um, and I got to thinking that what my kids did to these rats when I brought them home to make them so smart was kind of a curriculum. <laughs> uh, then I began saying things to myself like, what in the devil is a curriculum anyway? Uh, and 
So maybe I decided, I, I decided maybe I should go down to Washington and see what the people down there, I was a very active kid in those days, um, and go talk to those people in the National Academy who'd set up this committee on curriculum. And they, in turn, being a shrewd lot, said to me, well, uh, I think they're very interesting questions. I think what we ought to do is to bring all of you psychologists who are concerned with this kind of problem, together with the scientists who are trying to put together the new curriculum, let's see whether you can come to some point of view about something. Of course, it's getting like that. So, so what can you, you say no? <laughs> so I got stuck with the job of organizing this. So I invited a whole spectrum of psychologists to this meeting. Uh -huh. And I tell you, everyone, from Fred Skinner to the Skinner boxes to Bear Bell Inheld or Piaget's star right hand gal. Piaget, we would have invited Piaget as well, except Piaget never, interesting to me about learning theory, Piaget never learned to speak a word of English. I knew him for 25 years, and his English never got better. It was always at zero, <laughs> ah, which takes some doing. So, uh, we decided we'd have I mean, bring, bring these psychologists together with all these scientists who were running the committee on physical science study committee, the chemistry committee, the rest of it. We bring, bring them together down at Woods Hole on Cape Cod. Not all of you know Woods Hole, but it's lovely. And the, the great thing about Woods Hole is that there's a beautiful old house down there that the people who owned it gave to the National Academy of Sciences um, um, free for nothing, so, so the, 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 the National Academy uses it for occasional um, having peaceful meetings uh, in, that, in various stormy fields. But when it was done, this meeting in which we <coughs> talked about what in the world was a curriculum, how, how do you teach kids better, when it was all done, I sat down to write a report. That was some job. Not just for the Woods Hole crowd, that was easy to do. The fiery dream of transforming education. It had been its grip by that. I don't know when this came upon me, but it certainly got me in its grip in some way that was not easily tossed away. Um, so after this meeting at Woods Hole was over, what I did, came home, wrote at number nine, Bow Street, a thing like that. And in three weeks, I had a report written, a passionate report, and handed the finished draft over to Tom Wilson, a good friend who was then the very gifted director of the Harvard University Press. Did you ever know Tom? Uh, he was before my time. Well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, bless him, he brought I'm, 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 I'm getting away from my friend. Um, so it's the process of hearing you needed for the process of education. The process, yeah. So the, the Harvard he brought. He, I showed him the book. He looked at it and he said, "This is great." And by gosh, in no time flat, out came the book, and a neat little thing, a thin little volume. Um, uh, then the astonishments began, and I really must tell you they were astonishments to me. I thought I was writing with this book with passion, representing the point of view of a group of kind of far out eggheads who had got together on Cape Cod. Um, so as it started, the book got rave, the rave lead review in the New York Times book review. This was a marvelous book, and so on like that. In the Times book review? Uh, um, and then, a bit of Cold War irony. The first bit of the irony was that the first foreign language translation of the book was, yes, into Russian. <laughs> <laughs> Published with either permission or payment to the Harvard University. None of us ever received a cent from the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad to tell you that it's still in print over there and we still don't receive a cent. <laughs> And some of my Moscow friends tell me that it's, it is written in very eloquent Russian. <laughs> um, and now, Mirabla Dictu, the book's been translated into more than a dozen languages, and it's, what'd you say, it was a half million mark now? About 400,000. Oh, 400,000. 
Yeah. Um, and the thing that was so interesting, too, was that when it first came out, uh, it w w wasn't translated for some little while, but it was only a little while, into Chinese. Early on, I started getting letters from, chi from young Chinese students um, saying how much they appreciated the book. This was during the Mao period. Uh, and uh, <laughs> 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 Absolutely, yeah. But the book reopened a conception about what was the nature of mind and how mind might be used and how the young were not young by virtue of being more idiotic, but by virtue of somehow not being able to go as deeply, but they went in the same, they were just as rational as anybody else. Uh, and not that the adult model is exactly what we always want them to grow into either. Um, so there's been a lot of changes since then. I want to say a little bit about those changes. Um, there's no question that the process of education did some good things in terms of changing, proving education here and there. And there was a period of four or five years when there was real change and activity in the United States. But um, it wasn't that that needed change. It was something deeper. So let me close by saying these few words about some of my next ventures. The immediate next venture is itself rather symptomatic of the times. I was then serving on a White House committee concerned with the impact of poverty on our society, which was a subject that both President Kennedy, whom I had known well from his undergraduate days at Harvard, and Lyndon Johnson and, and Lady Bird Johnson, his wife as well, cared very much about that somehow the maldistribution of wealth in America was destroying the democratic society, which I think it still is. Um, studies around the country were making abundantly clear that kids from poverty backgrounds were doing very poorly in school lacking as they were in preschool, home-based opportunities for dialogue, for this, for that, shared reflection at home. Maybe I thought these kids could be better, do better, if we could just give them some sort of preschool head start, some, get them so that they could take advantage of the educational system, because the thing that was characteristic of this country is we had an educational system, but we didn't prepare people to use it, the, the, the people at the bottom of the, the scale. Um, well, I decided this, another trip to Washington was necessary, and uh, I was amazed at the reaction. Dear Pat Moynihan said to me, is that just what you would expect? The reaction was, you want the educational system to go down to these preschool kids, and you want the federal government to support this kind of thing? You're out of your mind. Um, <laughs> So anyway, uh, I'm a pretty persistent cuss, and I had some good friends who were equally <laughs> persistent. We managed finally to get funds, sort of peanut funds, and uh, we, put, we put Head Start with capital letters now as a program with some federal aid. Um, and I don't say that it's a perfect solution. It helps to give them some sort of a start. But then you have to take advantage of it. It's when they start getting into the stage where technically you're just going to let them go back into their lousy social situations at home, that doesn't work. You've got to keep the thing up. It's, it goes throughout. Um, so we have a long way to go. And I don't want us ever to think that we can let it go at that just by saying, well, don't be impatient. My urging is to be as impatient as possible, even today. For example, I picked out one statistic from this great pile of stuff on the top of my desk. 32% of kids who have spent more than half their lives before the third grade living in poverty fail to complete high school. 32% of kids. In contrast, with kids who have never lived in poverty, 6% of those kids fail to finish high school. Six versus third, that's five times as much. That's today. That's a report from last year. 
So let us not be smug about how clever our programs are. We have programs going, but we still have the same evils going. Of course, you know the appalling difference, for example, in the crime rate. Have you ever seen those things of kids who have finished high school as compared to the kids who have not finished high school? It takes your breath away. I mean, the fact of the matter is that we're spending, more, Patty, in your dear California, we're spending more on prisons than we are on schools at the moment. <laughs> it's not your California. I know what you So, if I were to write another book tomorrow about education, I am, but it's not about general education, it's more about the law. Um, I think that I, that I would be more concerned with these endemic, principally domestic, cultural matters that impose such unspeakable inequalities on our presumably democratic society. I mean, it's a society in which a smaller and smaller proportion of the population each year owns a larger and larger proportion of the wealth. And how do you expect a country of this sort to begin to develop a sense of possibility among its population generally? Why do we move toward this kind of rigidification and bureaucratization of the society? So I, I think that what we need now is to stop this business of separating education from the rest of the way in which we live in society. It, it, has, to, it has to take into account the socioeconomic basis of the society and where education fits in it. We've got to think about education as if it stopped at the schoolhouse door. I've, I've, been, I've been looking at this, I've been looking at this in an interesting kind of way for the last 15 years or so. I spent a month every summer going over to Reggio Emilia in Italy because, not, not because I'm pro, I'm pro Italian, yes, but that's not, that's not why I'm going over there. Uh, they're, doing, they're doing some experiments where you ask yourself, what kind of effect does this have? And what's striking to me about these Reggio Emilia schools, which are Scuola dell'Infanzia, uh, uh, kindergarten schools, uh, pre-kindergarten schools, what's striking to me is the extent to which it enlivens people as to the possibilities of a community, what a community can do. And they do it. So uh, even the old hard-boiled manufacturers of some of the high-tech manufacturing companies. I, I have a very funny role, uh, that is to say, if, if it happens that the contemporary mayor is a little bit anti-spending on education, what they do, and they've, they've had their Italian battle out, so they bring in me, the foreigner, and say, I've been looking at this very carefully. And, <laughs> and uh, it's interesting to see the way in which consciousness grows about the fact that education is not just kid stuff. It, 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 it's going to affect the distribution of wealth in the next generation, the distribution of self-respect in the next generation, and so on. So I want to bring up, make more conscious, make us more conscious of educational opportunity, but I don't want to do it just in the context of education. I want to do it in a broader, broader context, in terms of the economic life, the social life, the self-respect people. That is to say, why, why do so few kids from poverty backgrounds before the third grade, why is it that they end up not being able to finish school and get a high school degree? We're responsible for it by not distributing that. It's not, it's not those dumb kids. So um, I, I want to I wanna rescue education from the educational tradition. Um, I want to I get it into a world where we take into account the socio-economic political nature of our lives. And uh, that's the kind of study that I would want to do now. And I'm sure that the kind of response that you would get to it is, uh, why don't you stick to the business at hand, education, <laughs> Because to some extent, education locks the inequalities into the system. If you broadened it, it would unlock to some extent. That's what I think. Um, that, isn't, that isn't exactly a, a picture expressing 
deep satisfaction with the current state of affairs, but anybody who expressed deep satisfaction with the current state of affairs in America, and I should add, because I also know a little bit about the Italian scene in most of the countries of Western, anybody who thinks things are okay, uh, I'd better go see their psychiatrist. <laughs> You may be seated. <laughs> Dr. Brunner has agreed to answer some uh, questions, so any questions? Any, any questions for the troublemaker? Howard. These were the two questions which I think we all heard from Pat Graham if there were going to be Woods Hole 2011 or 2012, would you invite the same kind of folks or different? And then um, Rick, Rick Schwader's question of a very different sort is, when did, when did you begin to become nervous about the, the cognitive revolution and its discontents? <laughs> so <laughs> Woods, Hole and, Woods Hole today and the cognitive, the doubts about the cognitive revolution. Well, I think to answer Rick's question, to some extent, the cognitive revolution depends to a, in certain measure too on the extent to which we enable thought. We give it the instruments and the social environment necessary for the full expression of itself in the way, for example, that the development of a system of justice made possible justice for all, not justice for the, not just justice for the elite, uh, the distribution of that kind of thing. And I... I want, to, I, want to see, I want to see schools of education particularly. Well, to start off with, I think I'd like to see them abolished. Um, and, <laughs> and, I, and, and, then, and then, I, then, then what I'd like to do is to rescue their people and put them together with economists and political scientists and psychologists. And this would be good for psychologists too, I think, along the way. Um, so, um, yeah, and when, you know, if you, if you, think, if you think of scholarly fields as enterprises, there should be some way in which you should judge after a certain period of time, how is the enterprise doing in the same way as, for example, you judge economic enterprises, that is to say, uh, how are we doing with respect to the manufacturer? I see this lovely rug here of rugs. Um, so how are we doing with respect to the manufacture of educational classes for kids? Um, do, we, do we do it? Do, do we unready them? Do we give them? <clears throat> the French have a wonderful expression that doesn't quite translate into English. They speak of a kind of, of early training as a une déformation professionnelle. Uh, <laughs> Uh, une déformation is not necessarily a bad thing, but we give them une déformation that is sort of impenetrable. Um, and w w we shut them off from learning. Uh, uh, I have to say that Mary Brabeck and I have lunch once every couple of months. We ought to have it more often together. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and try to figure out ways of doing it and what kind of conferences and so on like that. But, but it's, it's the sort of thing, we need more effort, energy in doing and more inventiveness. And uh, yeah, yeah. Who, whom should we put in charge? C'est tellement intéressant comme question alors. Any more questions? So, Howard, you don't get an invitation. That's the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Any other <laughs> questions? Who you put in charge? Question mark. La situation est grave et encore Who would invite if there was going to be another Woods Hole conference? Who would invite to Woods Hole? 
first thought that comes to mind is if there's a gentleman who lives on Pennsylvania Avenue by the name of Bob, I would invite him. And I think I would ask him to be the chairman. And I think he is the right person to do it. Um, uh, Jerry Bruner uh, had as his main qualification that it's a very lively sense of discontent. <laughs> But uh, he didn't have the necessary apparatus for doing something about it. Uh, this gentleman by the name of Barack Obama on Pennsylvania Avenue uh, might know what to do about it. Uh, but then at the same time, you would also have to bring in some of the key backward types from the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue uh, from Congress uh, to make them aware of opportunities. Um, a democracy is hard to work with, but uh, we have an election coming up. I don't need to get into electioneering at this particular point. But bear in mind when you vote for your candidates next time round, look to what they have to say about the future and education. Yeah. Well, I think everybody's been warned enough. <laughs> Thank you so much for that final warning.